Right, welcome to our first video revision session on stave one of A Christmas Carol. So this is going to be a really quick zoom through what happens in stave one, what we need to know about the characters, what we need to remember to take forward to the rest of the book. Right, the first person that we meet, as you know, is Scrooge. He is a classic Victorian miser, meaning that he values money more than he values love. In fact, love isn't very important to him at all. He is described as being very, very cold. The quotation is, he carries his own low temperature around with him. And he is always associated with the weather, which of course, because it's December, is cold, bleak, foggy, biting weather. Um, the weather is consistently personified. It's actually given human qualities as if it's coming to get you, as um, are many of Scrooge's very negative qualities as well. Now, Scrooge works in an office, and we know that he's involved in something financial. It's not made clear in Stave 1, but we later find out that he's a money lender. So he, he takes advantage of people who are very much in need. Um, he lends them money at extortionate interest rates, and that's how he makes um, such a nice living for himself. Not that he manages to spend it. In complete contrast to Scrooge, his opposite in the novel is his clerk, who's called Bob Cratchit. Now, Bob Cratchit is full of love. He's a very happy young chap. He doesn't have any money. That's why I've drawn him with his comforter, not his overcoat, because he can't afford an overcoat. Uh, and it says, cold as he was, he was warmer than Scrooge. Now, this playing around with temperature is quite significant, because uh, even though Bob is permanently physically cold because Scrooge won't give him any cold to put on his fire. He is warm because in his heart he's got love, he's got love from his family. Um, whereas Scrooge, who has all the money in the world and could make himself as materially comfortable as he wants to be, is constantly described as being, um, he's got a frosty rhyme on his head, um, meaning he's got grey hair but it's described as frosty. So this coldness and he's hard and sharp as flint, he never thaws out, basically. Um, He's almost effectively dead. He's described as having no life in him whatsoever. He's rock-like. He's described as being hard granite. Um, because someone, someone we really don't care about at all. How weird. Right. They're in their office. Um, it's Christmas Eve. It's a time when everyone should be caring and loving, and it's all about family, and it's all about sharing and giving. And in comes his only family in the world, which is his nephew, Fred. And we have a little... Fred versus Scrooge match. Now Fred is permanently very happy, very cheerful, a little bit like Bob, but slightly better off. He's described as being ruddy and handsome, so physically he's in complete contrast to Scrooge. He's the opposite of um, Scrooge's kind of paleness and uh, the, the blue lips, red eyes. He's an image of vitality, of healthiness, of happiness. Um, and he talks about love. They, they get into this conversation about why is Christmas important. Um, why, you know, and Scrooge asks him, why did he get married? And he says, I fell in love. Scrooge has no time for that whatsoever. His only reason for doing anything ever is if it has a financial reward. So the idea of doing something because you're in love is completely alien to him. And they have this um, conversation in which Fred is trying to invite him round for Christmas lunch. And Scrooge completely refuses. He shuts down completely. And what he actually does is he repeats the phrase, good afternoon, five times. It's completely rude. He won't listen to what he's got to say. And his only way of getting rid of him is just to shut down completely and repeat, good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. Demonstrating how completely um, unloving, uncaring, antisocial. He's very rude. They have a lovely exchange in which Fred says, uh, oh, Scrooge says, what, what reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. And uh, Fred responds, well, what reason have you to be, what is it? What reason have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. The idea for Scrooge, again, that money is everything. And, you know, you buy, you buy your way in life. Um, finally, Fred leaves having listened to Scrooge go on about bar humbug Christmas and Christmas is a time for paying bills without money. And he gives Scrooge a little piece of his mind and he says that Christmas is a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time, the only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. 
So what he's saying is at Christmas, and maybe the only time of the year, we all of us think about people who are um, below us, who are poor. We should think about the poor. We should realise that we're all humans. We're all going to die. We're all mortal. And that while we're on this journey, we ought to look out for each other. And that's the first time we're introduced to this as a key message of the book, which is looking after other people and being accountable for your actions. And it's something that Scrooge has to learn because it doesn't come naturally to him. So Fred leaves and he is replaced in Scrooge's office by the charity collectors, two portly gentlemen who come because it's Christmas um, and because it's a time when a lot of people suffer and other people maybe feel extra generous. And they've come to collect some money to help the poor. Scrooge is disgusted by this. He says, are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? The treadmill and the poor laws are in, uh, this is my image of a treadmill, are still working. And these people, these poor people lived in, who lived in complete poverty had nothing and they'd be put into a workhouse, they'd work until they died, they'd live on very little. It's a miserable existence. But of course, if you're Scrooge and if money is life, then uh, that's, that's fair enough, you've got no money, you may as well live a miserable existence. The charity collectors say many would rather die than go into those conditions. And um, Scrooge says, well, in that case, they had better do so and decrease the surplus population. Now, we know that these are words that are going to come back to haunt Scrooge. So what he's basically saying is, if you're poor, you might as well be dead. The irony is, of course, that he's rich and also may as well be dead because for all the life there is in him and all the love there is in him. Anyway. Uh, eventually he leaves, he goes through the grim, foggy, horrible night on Christmas Eve in London and he goes back to his miserable little rooms. On his way in he sees a little apparition, he looks at his door knocker and he imagines that he sees the ghost of his dead partner who's been dead seven years, Jacob Marley. But because he's such a, a very clinical, a very literal man, he just thinks, oh this must be a trick of the light, it can't possibly be the case. So he goes in and we've got this lovely description of Scrooge's rooms. Um, so we've got that he's got this meagre fireplace with a handful of fuel on it. He's got his saucepan of gruel, you know, he's really living a miser's lifestyle. And there's a, a bell, a disused bell, which becomes important in a minute. And it's described as um, dark and he says darkness is cheap and Scrooge liked it. So he's prepared to live in these miserable conditions just to save money. However, suddenly the bell starts to ring. The bell heralds the entrance of Marley's ghost, who is described as a dreadful apparition. So it's the ghost of his dead partner. And of course, because he doesn't care about that sort of thing, he doesn't believe it, Scrooge is completely disbelieving. He says, well, this could be a trick of the mind, you're a bit of undigested beef, there's more of gravy than of grave about you. It's Scrooge's attempt at a joke. But he soon has to admit that actually this is happening. Marley is rattling a fearsome chain. He's a classic macabre gothic image of what a ghost is. He's howling, he's got his jaw strapped around his head because otherwise it drops open onto his chest. He's rattling this chain and on the chain it's full of cash boxes and all these images of things that he had in life. And he says, I wear the chain I forged in life. So abs everything that he ever did wrong, all the bad stuff he ever did in his life has resulted in this chain. And then he warns Scrooge, I've, you've, been, you've lived seven years longer than I ever did. You have laboured on it since. So basically what you're going to suffer is far worse than what I'm suffering. And he talks about the incessant torture of remorse. So the torture of regretting and feeling bad about what you've done. He's saying that's, that's one of the worst things. He can't deal with it. He's completely tortured by it. Scrooge has to admit that there might be something in this. So um, he goes, he, he realises that what he's saying is true and he asks for some comfort and he gives him none. He says, you're going to be visited by three spirits. He said, there's no greater sin than life's opportunity misused. As in, life is a gift. Life is something that you can really make something of and you're wasting it. You're misusing it. So you're going to be visited by three ghosts. Scrooge isn't so happy about that. He's like, oh, do I have to? I'd rather not bother. Can I just get it over and done with in one? He says, no, you might as well suffer. So that's what happens. And at the end of stave one, we're looking to see what happens when the ghost of Christmas past comes in stave two. Scrooge has fallen asleep because, you know, he's that worried. So what do we need to remember? We need to remember how bad Scrooge is, that Scrooge is an image of everything that is 
against Christianity, against generosity. Um, he's an image of all that was bad in Victorian society, which was that there was a huge divide between the rich and the poor. Um, that the rich got richer, the poor got poorer, and if there was no kind of a possibility of transitioning between the two, if the, if the rich weren't prepared to help the poor out, then things were pretty bad indeed, and that was the message that Dickens was trying to get across. You've also got this idea of um, how, how complicated life can be, that you've got all these different stratas of people into weaving with each other and linking up in life, and that actually, as, um, as Fred said, you know, it's very difficult at times to remember that you're all humans together and that you need to look out for each other. So it's very important that we understand that Scrooge is the worst that we can possibly imagine him to be. It's also quite important that we care about Bob Cratchit because he becomes a very significant character later on. And he's been set up in this opposition, in this uh, contrast to Scrooge. Um, it's the first stave, uh, it's kind of the introduction, it's the point at which the main themes are introduced. This idea of redemption, of, of atoning for your sins. Um, the possibility of making good what you have done, so this idea of Christian redemption, and particularly the fact that it's at Christmas. Set at Christmas because it's a time where, in which we all feel like we ought to be doing better than we normally do, we ought to consider people more than we normally do. The idea that this has no effect on Scrooge whatsoever demonstrates again just how bad he is. There's some interesting language stuff in there, there's some humour, there's some really nice imagery, we'll come back to that at another time. So you've got Fred, you've got Scrooge, you've got Bob, you've got Marley's ghost, and you've got uh, a major cut-off point, which is leaving the reader wondering exactly what is going to happen next. And we'll look at that separately. <laughs>